Get, what is the YP on this one? Alright. So I think if we go back to the ways that we can solve this. So it's non-homogeneous. And we had a finite number of derivatives. So... We're here, section 21, case one. That, in my opinion, is probably the fastest way to solve this. So we, we don't have homogeneous because it equaled x. So I couldn't just do the homogeneous. Uh, so we had to look at linear combo, all the terms and their derivatives. So if we go into here, uh, terms and their derivatives, <coughs> there's just an x. So the zero derivative is x. The first derivative is constant. So we'll get ax plus b, uh, and then what was that again? So you got 2 for a? 2x uh, two two minus 3. So you plug in yp, and yp prime, and yp double prime, and that's how you get a and b. So I don't want to go through that process, because that takes a couple extra minutes. So that should be very familiar at this point. Yeah, I'd have to use the, I think, section 23 or 22 if the derivatives of the right side were not finite. So if I got infinite independent derivatives, then I wouldn't be able to do this easy method. I have to do that funky Kramer's rule, whole thing like that. Uh, okay. So above, I wrote down somewhere... Uh, we're going to discard YC. We're only going to use YP. So forget about YC. Don't worry about that. We're just going to set Y equal to just YP, which is 2X minus 3. All right, how does this Y relate to our original? Yeah, well, it's mostly that this equals y, which is what we have right here. So the answer is, what is this crazy operator on x? The answer is 2x minus 3. It just took a lot of work to figure that out. All right, so it was all that work to figure out that the result of this weird operator on x is 2x minus 3. Probably not the way that you were thinking that we would go and compute it. So we used the functional definition, which is kind of the backwards way of doing it. We didn't really invert the operator at all. Or we didn't compute the inverse operator. We moved to the other side and computed the differential equation solution. <coughs> okay. So up next, uh, I'm going to write a couple notes or comments. There'll be several notes here. So back in the good old function days, uh, this would have an asymptote at x equals 1. But if the same exact function f of d, I'm just replacing x by d. 
So if you just look at the way this is written, you might be worried, oh, oh this should be, yeah. You might be worried, oh, there's going to be a vertical asymptote on f of d. But can d equal 1? Does that make any sense for d equal to? No, d is an operator. d doesn't equal 1. So there's no vertical asymptote to worry about here. So this function right here, d is, oops. D is not equal to 1. Moreover, d is not a real number or a complex number. So d is not a number. So it doesn't make sense to worry about plugging in 1 for d. So there's no vertical asymptote. Uh, d is itself a function. It operates on other functions and gives you other functions that are derivatives. So d itself is a function um, and will never take a value. So you don't have to worry about non-invertible uh, der uh, derivative operators. You don't have to worry about non-invertible differential operators. So now we'll talk about the easiest uh, inverse derivative operator. is just d negative n operates on q of x and if this equals y we flip this around this means q x equals the nth derivative of y how would you solve for y here so it's basically y to the nth derivative how would you solve for y how do you get the nth derivative out of there easy calculus question. Integrate how many times? N times. So just integrate N times. Well, all you have to do, like we just said, is integrate N times. That's what it means on the left side as well. It's the exact same relationship, just written in the inverse versus the non-inverse version. So whenever you see D to the negative N, that just means take N antiderivatives. That's exactly what we do on the left. Uh, and you're going to ignore constants of integration when you do this. In this section. So let's do an example. get the second antiderivative of 2x plus 3. And don't worry about your constant of integration. So you should have two terms at the end that have higher powers of x. You shouldn't end up with four terms like you normally would. And I recommend apply one antiderivative at a time. You probably haven't applied lots of antiderivatives in a row before. Like you maybe have done a double derivative in your head. should get x cubed over 3 plus 3 halves x squared. So, relatively easy example. Alright, what is the inverse uh, derivative of 0? So I could write it as integral of 0 dx. What's antiderivative of zero? 
to zero. Normally it would be a constant. So I'll write C, but really we don't we don't want our constants are so really going to have zero here. What would I get if I did P of D and then P inverse of D on any function, whether it's Y or Q or anything? Should get the function back. So we can cancel derivative operators with the inverse. So just like any other function that's invertible, you can basically apply the inverse function and they'll cancel out. Uh, if you need the identity function, if you want to uh, rewrite what we wrote here without y's, uh, so the identity function is a capital one. So you could write one of y, which is one of x is just x, the identity function. Some other resources may write it as id of x like that, meaning the identity function. So. There's different ways it's written. Uh, the reason this is useful is because I can use purely functional notation I don't care about the input in this way of writing PD P inverse D equals 1. So you can write just the function so if I compose these two operators that's the same as doing nothing as the do nothing function, which is the identity. So I wrote that relationship up there without writing the input in. So I just wrote this function composition equals the identity function. What is that symbol mean again? Which, which one? The one that is the one. It's the identity function. Identity. Yeah. It's the function whose input is the same as its output. So basically you can erase it and not change anything. So that's the exact same thing as applying to function one. So that's why they call it the identity. It doesn't change the identity of what you applied it to. So we can now write the solution of PDY equals BX to the K is y equals p inverse d of bx to the k. Now, if we don't know how to compute p inverse d, it's a different story, but at least I can move the differential operator to the other side now, even if I can only do it with notation at the moment. Um, if the operator is super easy, like uh, d to the negative 4, I could just compute it. If it's not a trivial, uh, operator, we're going to look and see how to uh, figure that. So we're going to see how to uh, go, how to find P inverse D from regular P of D. So if P of D is AN DN plus A1D plus A0, which we'll write as summation AK DK equals 0 to N, then P inverse D is going to be 1 over P of D it will also be a summation from k equals 0 to, it may not be the same degree, dk dk, where, this is the important part, bk is going to be the sum, oops, and I can't use 
I can use K there, I'll use I down here. I is gonna go from one to K. I'm worried that one of these should be starting at zero. So if you can look in your book. Oh, and I switch the roll of I and K. No book? Oh no. There should be K minus I in the way that I'm writing the B subscript. Nope, I had it right. Uh, now, M, how in the world do we compute M? Where M is the smallest integer. Such that DM plus one of DX to the K equals zero. All right, so what is M? We can actually figure out M from this right here. No, it's going to be related to K. It's going to be close to K. So let's do an easy example. If I did a D M plus 1 of X, just regular X, how many derivatives would I have to take before I get 0? So on my second derivative, I get 0. So what would be the minimum m value so that this equals 0, no matter what x is? One. m is 1. So if m is 1, I'm having the second derivative of x would have to be 0. Does that make sense? So that would be m is 1. If I went with x squared, and I wanted to make sure that that derivative was 0, how many derivatives total would I have to take to make x squared zero? So two turns into a constant, three turns it into zero. So I would need the third derivative, so that would be m is two. So now ready to describe the x to the k, what value of m would I need here? So I think it'll be k. So we can write that m is actually just k. Oh no. Oh, that's why I use eyes in the notes. All right, we're gonna have to redo all the subscripts. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'll just make it match the book. That's gonna be way easier. All right, so I need to replace, basically I'm gonna replace most of these k's by i's. There was a reason K was being used. DI. So the next sum we're going to turn into I's as well. That, hopefully that matches the book now. Maybe not super easy to find. Somewhere in there they'll talk about inverting, how we actually invert an operator. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so we're going to solve an example using P inverse. So we're going to uh, be looking at P of D, and then we're going to compute the inverse, and then apply it on the other side. All right, before we get P inverse D, we have to figure out regular P of D. So write down the derivative operator that gives us 4y double prime minus 3y prime plus 9y. That should be pretty easy at this point. I'll give you a hint, you start with 4d squared. So we got 4d squared minus 3d plus 9. So regular P of D, 4D squared minus 3D plus 9. So any questions on this part? So everybody's okay with this? All right, now I have to figure out, <coughs> I want to invert P of D, and I have to use, I should put a box around this because it's pretty important. So P inverse is going to look like a sum of, uh, now I have to figure out what is K, first of all, so, or what is M? What is M for us here? How many derivatives would I need to take out X squared? Three derivatives, so it's one less than that, so our M is two. So it's based on that power on the right, not this coincidence that it's the same power as our uh, polynomial operator. That's a coincidence. So m is 2 based off the x squared. So our m is 2. And ei is summation k equals 1 to i ak b i minus k. So our regular p d, this is a2 d2 minus a1 d1 plus a0. So I'm just writing out a2 is 4, a1 is, is negative 3, and a0 is 9. Any questions about grabbing the a values, a1, a0, 1, and 2? So let's figure out b0 first. So b0 is the sum, k equals 1, 2, uh oh, that's not good. What's the problem with this sum right away? It's going back. So you got to start with an index that's not greater than your last index. You can start with them equal. It's a boring sum, but it's sum of one thing. Uh, so we got a problem. All right. I'm thinking it's probably k should start at zero. I think we gotta go back, start k at zero. K at zero, k at zero. All right, so let's take a break. We'll stop here. I'll make sure that we get these indexes right because we're not gonna get the right result if we don't start out the right way here.